Okay. Continue a bit with uh, point seven. Uh, <coughs> because it boils down to whether the traffic control features are contributing <coughs> in a way that the users of the transport system is uh, is faced with uh, with the true costs, the the socio-economic costs of using the transport network. And I the the most let's say the most uh, easiest case to understand or the most evident case is congestion pricing. And uh, if we have volume and uh, transport costs along the vertical axis and volume along the horizontal axis, and we have a typical cost function for, uh, for transport use in urban areas, so, uh, which looks something like this. And you have, at some point in time, or some place, you have a, <coughs> a constraint, capacity constraint. When you reach the capacity constraint, you can it, the costs goes to, to in infinity, meaning that you just s it's a gridlock. You 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 cannot move anywhere. Uh, so this is the cost that uh, that the road users pay, and you can uh, you can imagine two situations. One is this one, and this is a this is a demand curve. Downward sloping, meaning that uh, when when the costs go down, the transport costs go down, the, the, the demand increases for transport increases. And in this level, you have a balance here, which is uh, which means that uh, this is the transport. Undertaken in the middle of the day, no, no congestion, no queuing at all. But then, <coughs> when you are going to or from work in the afternoon or in the morning, the demand is much higher. Lot, lot more cars on the road. And the costs are starting to increase because you get some queuing congestion. And it may even be up at this level with very, very severe congestion. So <coughs> the costs are, uh, are moving upwards. And we get. cost for the users, they, they increase a bit. And that is cost connected to the fact that you spend more time in your car. Uh, the fuel consumption may increase a bit, and, uh, and, and, you, and you get some costs. But th what happens when you enter into a situation like this is that the average speed of the network goes down. And when the average speed of the network goes down, you affect also all the other users that uses the road at the same time as you. So when your car enters, the average speed goes down. And if you, <coughs> if you think about it, I guess most of you have had driven along a, a congested road into, a, into an urban, into let's say Oslo or other big, bigger cities, you may have a, a dual carriageway like this, and you have uh, not 
the dual one but you have cars wanting to to enter the main road and then you have a lot of cars here where you have such ramps leading more cars into this network before such ramps you you get you get congestion after the ramp it loses up again it, uh, the traffic flows better until the next ramp comes and this is actually what happens when when this curve goes up the average speed goes down the other ones need to wait a bit longer and that's why <coughs> we get the system where you have another cost curve that starts to, to increase sharper at this stage. And that is the social marginal cost curve. And the difference is connected to the extra time that is imposed to all the other users as well. And this is the cost curve for, for the extra user that come the, 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 the this car that's going into the system will face these costs, which they pay for through the use of time and through the use of fuel and everything. But the true costs will be much higher. It could be at that level. Because of the waiting time for all the others. And to correct for this, we need to set the price of road use equal to the, mar the social marginal costs, which are here. A bit higher. When you impose the costs, the extra costs, you reduce the traffic QP1 QP2 and you are going to charge the difference which is this level so this is the road user charge that is needed to correct for this deviation between the private and the social marginal costs. The point here is that <coughs> we get a reduction in traffic and we get an increase in costs and this affects the way people behave. They may choose differently they may choose to uh, to uh, to locate themselves differently to avoid these these extra costs um, the need for road capacity is slightly reduced because of this this pricing system without this pricing system the signal sort of to the authorities is that we have a lot of problems here because uh, we we are we have this traffic volume, whereas if we have internalized these, uh, this is an external effect. We have not that much traffic, and hence we can reduce perhaps the need for extra road capacity, or we can postpone the investments. Let's say wait a few years before we have to. We have to be ha before we have to undertake the investments. So when we when we try to model urban transport systems, we also we should also model the systems when we have the correct pricing in place. This point, which reflects what usage costs 
not only the individual user, but the, but the society at large. And then plan based on, let's say, the adjusted volumes and, uh, and, uh, and what could be the result of such systems. This is not without problems. And now we are, let's say, starting to move towards um, location, behavior, and so on. Because in many cases, you have, a, you have a central business district, the core of the city. You may have a, you may have a ring road, like this. Of course, with uh, linkages into the, the, the urban core. And then you have roads coming in from, uh, from uh, suburbs, other places outside of this urban core. And this may be a very stylized picture of Oslo. It may be a very stylized picture of London, Amsterdam, as I will show you later. And what is, is often done is that uh, we put up such uh, mechanisms, toll collection places, here, 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 and here. And uh, everybody's happy, at least the economists uh, could be happy with a solution like this. But what might happen, do you think? Yeah, perhaps more accidents. But if you think in terms of urban structures, traffic flows, what could happen here? I talked about condensed cities versus spreads, dispersed cities, and so on. That could be the case. People living here may move to here and do their businesses inside of this, causing a lot of congestion, but uh, you don't capture it because the, the collection points are here. That is one <coughs> side effect of this. Another effect is that people are uh, not using this arterial road as much as they used to in the first place, but they divert their activities to other places instead, so you can get the spread of the city, of, of activities, and you can get a dispersion spreading of, of the urban area because of these toll collection places. Then you can do your businesses outside of this, and you can you can uh, attract businesses, residential areas, which are which then locate themselves outside of this urban core. So, if you, as a planner, think that well, we should reduce the pressure on this area, but at the same time, we want people to live there to have these condensed, nice urban transport, uh, public transport systems and things like that, then you need to have a much more advanced system for toll collection, where you also need to, to, uh, to charge users that are not only using this road, but also other roads that, need that might be congested in the, in the future because we will get congestion uh, in this area as well as time flows, time goes by. So the systemic way of thinking is very important here. And I have, <coughs> I wrote an article in a, in a scientific journal some years back where I said that you should combine this way of thinking with an uh, with an upgrading of the public transport system, so you need to do both. You need to do both at the same time. So.
so that people can have an alternative to avoid using their car they, they need to have an alternative by uh, by public transport and now i'm talking about bigger cities to avoid this spreading of uh, of activity and more car use and everything if you don't have the carbon taxes on fuel in place as i said it's a problem in in many in man, many places it's a problem in china in the us uh, in india where the where the fuel taxes are uh, they fuel may be even subsidized in some countries then the problem becomes quite strong because then the, the then you shift the whole cost curve for the private users downwards whereas you have still the social cost curve the, the it's it's valid it, it that, that one will not shift because that curve should encompass should include adequate correct fuel taxes and taxes for uh, for uh, for the congestion if you don't have that in place you will have even an even stronger demand if you just charge according to the private costs because then the fuel is cheaper and uh, and you have a, a larger incentive to use your car And then the difference between the actual and the optimal volume increases. So, uh, so, um, so this affects what we're going to talk about uh, later on in the course, the uh, location behavior and urban structures. Parking. <coughs> is another way of uh, dealing with uh, with uh, undesired car use pressure on the core urban core but it has the same effect as the as these toll collection points when it comes to spreading of urban activities financial resources of course, you need to you need to have them in place because uh, it costs a lot to to expand a transport network. But <laughs> there you have also another very interesting uh, point, which has to do with incentives. Because the financial resources may be unevenly distributed between the road transport authorities and the public transport authorities. As in Norway, the public or the, the, the road authorities, they are funded directly from the, from the government, the state, at least for the, for the main roads, main highways. And they are, they are allowed to use tolls, toll roads, to fund infrastructure, so they can they can uh, charge for the use of, of roads, not to avoid congestion, but to just fund them. If you have if you have driven a bit around in, in Norway, you will will see quite a lot of of such uh, places where you pay for road usage. Whereas the public transport authorities. They are based on, uh, they are operating at the county level. They get their fund, the public transport, get their funds from the counties. And they don't have any possibility to fund by using road tolls or anything. So it's harder, much harder to fund large improvements in in the public transit system as it is organized in in many places 
I'm, this is what I describe now. It's the situation in Norway, but it's, uh, it's like that in many places. So one thing is the money available, but the other thing is how, how easy it is to get, get, to get access to the, f to the funds. Um, there are more factors, uh, which again has to do with f the situation in the future. Um, this has to do with uh, with uh, forecasts for car use and public transit use. Uh, higher income means at least from history, that car use increases, car ownership increases. And uh, you have this, uh, this demand for mobility, which is an income elastic good or commodity. You have this uh, income elasticity, which you used in the four-step model. It's the same mechanism here. But, uh, but used in, uh, in transport demand instead of demand for exports. So it's a lot of factors that sort of points in the direction of increased car use. But again, it's an open question whether that will be the situation in the future. Because you have this uh, traditional life cycle curve, which uh, which goes something like this, where this could be the demand for uh, for uh, car use. Uh, here is the situation in the around 1900, when the car was invented. It took a long time before the demand took off. Then you had a sharp increase towards the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And now it starts to level off. We see that there is a tendency that the demand for car use is, is kind of leveling off as time goes by. It's not negative, but it's it is a slightly reduced growth rate. So, <coughs> if we are planners and uh, we we are here in let's say year two thousand, and we try to say something about the future demand, we tend to use data let's say for this period, we show the strong growth. Will that continue into the future? It's very difficult to answer. I am actually working with that now in, in connection with, uh, with the Oslo main airport, where the forecasts are based on a very strong historical growth. And I am very much in doubt <coughs> whether I can rely on those numbers for the future. Among other things, they are based on a situation where uh, the aviation industry doesn't pay, or they pay very little, carbon taxes. So can we expect this to, to continue like this? or? Will we have something? Okay, so this, we call this a fan. Upper, lower, and middle estimate on, on the traffic road. But this is a market saturation curve, we call it, which we need to discuss when we do long-term planning. Yeah, this is uh, more detailed on uh, on uh, on the 
demographic trends and uh, and uh, and uh, things. It, 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 this is actually explanatory factors in a demand model that we use when we when we do forecasts. Population growth is driving demand, of course. Aging population is. Uh, we need to know a bit about travel behavior in in different let's say different ages in the population and we can use that information to say something about what will happen when the when uh, when the population is uh, on average getting older which is a problem in Europe and it's a problem in China and it's also a problem in the US at least parts of the US <coughs> yeah so there are s there are certain uh, certain issues to to pay attention to and the, la the last one the changes in, in land use uh, we talked a bit about that in connection with uh, congestion pricing and we'll come back to that also in uh, in uh, in subsequent lectures there are uh, and I, I think I, I, I actually want to list up all these factors because it says something about the complexity when we are going to talk about and we are going to, to engage ourselves in, in transport planning and economic development issues. If we talk about uh, trade, global trade, regional trade, we we uh, we are uh, diving into a very difficult field also which also affects the demand for transport um, i mentioned this example with a better connection between norway and the uh, european union transport wise transport wise and uh, whether it was an open question as to whether the Norwegian manufacturing industry would benefit from a better access to Europe or not. That depends on, uh, on, on the competition. Other factors are connected to, uh, let's say, telecommunication devices. It's much easier now to, to work from home instead of uh, going to work every day, which can uh, have a, a big impact on, uh, on tr transport demand in urban areas. Whether we still will continue the, the, the trend of uh, with outsourcing and offshoring of activities to, to, uh, to other countries, now I'm talking about the industry, will of course have, uh, have impacts on, on, on transport demand. So there is there are a lot of things that we we need to to discuss when we are going to engage engage, engage in, in in transport planning. Uh, I have said this already: the interdependencies with other urban systems. Uh, there are also interdependencies between road transport and public transport. When you improve <coughs> the highway network flowing into a city center, you can, uh, you can for instance, add, you can add another line on both sides increase the capacity to three lanes on, on both uh, in each direction instead of two. The interesting thing with such an improvement is that <coughs> if you just do it and, and, and keep the lanes open for, uh, for all types of road traffic, the road users, the, the private cars, they will benefit from this. But what about the, the public transit users? 
relatively to the private car users. Hmm? Because Yeah, and, uh, and the bus, we'll talk about the bus here, they need to stop on regular intervals to, to take people on board and to, to let people off, which takes the same amount of time, no matter how free the flow is on the, on the road, how fast the flow is on the road. So relatively speaking, if you improve the road, the highway network, the and the even if you have buses using the same network, the relative improvement will be higher for the cars. Those of you who might be particularly interested in this can look up some something that is called Down's Law. There are some literature on that which describes this phenomenon in detail. So, um, yeah, this is uh, more or less uh, dealt with already. Uh, you can just have that for uh, for your uh, information. Uh, one of you mentioned uh, traffic casualties, which of course is an issue in uh, in these networks uh, as well. Um, but this. let's say this array of interest groups that are involved in transport planning are, are making this a very interesting and very demanding uh, field to, to, to operate within. I have mentioned incentive structures already. So, um, there are uh, issues that uh, that uh, needs to be taken into consideration. At one of the first lectures, I mentioned decoupling of economic growth from transport growth, because there has been a strong linkage between the growth in the demand for transport and the, s the and growth in 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 the economy gdp growth um <coughs> and uh, there are attempts made to break that link so that uh, we can have economic growth without having the same growth in uh, in uh, let's say road transport production vehicle kilometers on on the road um, and uh, uh, there are issues within a lot of these areas, let's say the land use, the pricing of transport, um, the political institutional system that is, uh, is a part of, uh, let's say, which represents stakeholders and needs to be consulted when we uh, when we design these these systems are uh, are also adding complexity to this so we try to work perhaps mostly on this part of the picture to try to work out scenarios try to design transport models, and I'll show you an example of that later on, a very uh, simple illustration, to be able to say something about the linkage between all these, uh, let's say, pricing, uh, also the supply of public transport, and how that will affect the demand. And how demand, uh, in terms of uh, let's say, expected growth in population, expected location of, of businesses, how that can affect the transport flows. And uh, in the next round, how should we try to design the transport systems 
to meet to meet that demand. And this is uh, kind of what we what we have uh, as status now in in Europe when it comes to transport growth with, uh, as compared to or in the light of economic growth but we haven't managed yet to have this decoupling of freight transport from the GDP growth. There are many reasons for that but one of them it has clearly to do with um, let's say that increased demand for agility in the supply chain. You can order things on the internet and get it delivered more or less on your door the next day. Small shipments, um, high level of product variety, focus on, uh, on uh, outsourcing, offshoring, a decentralized production structure, offshoring to, to developing countries and so on, which increases the freight transport. Passenger transport has more or less paralleled economic growth, so a 10% increase in, uh, in GDP means around 10% increase in transport volumes, but that tendency is about to show a pattern like this with a saturation. The greenhouse gas problem, I've talked a bit about that. Um, a growth in uh, air passenger share of the transport production, which is uh, by many considered as a problem because air transport is very energy uh, intensive. Car occup occupancy and load factors decline, which is not a good thing because it means that capacity is, uh, is underutilized. Uh, this is what is on the blackboard. Price structures are aligned with, but still below the true, let's say, the correct social marginal costs. And this is the main, the main challenge in, in, in many countries, that you have urbanization, centralization, I know that Brazil has had that in, uh, in many, many, many years. And uh, even in this country, the centralization towards, let's say, the central eastern part of Norway is, is stronger than ever. So, uh, yeah. There are some data that can support uh, our thinking. This is. Uh, major cities in the in the world this is urban density which increases persons per uh, per hectare and this is the total per head per capita vehicle kilometers so we see that as density increases it's a tendency that that the, the mileage per uh, capita is uh, is decreasing so to have Denser uh, areas like uh, like New York or uh, some of the German cities, some of the British cities, some of the French cities are uh, is a good thing to to reduce transport activity. I will come back to that more in the, in a couple of, of weeks. This summarizes some links between uh, between then transport planning and uh, and land use, where uh, the land use factors are, li are listed here: regional accessibility, density, meaning uh, density in urban areas. Uh, this is more um, directed towards the quality of the uh, of the urban center uh, and you have a lot of let's say conditions which are related to to land use 
<coughs> here we have the impact for for uh, for transport. Um, you have a lot of attention now towards uh, cycling and walking in in urban areas. In Norway, it is a ob political objective now that all the growth in transport in the main cities should be served by walking and cycling, meaning no growth in car use. And uh, that is a political objective. And we, as planners, we have said that you can just forget that. It will, n it will never happen. Unless you really implement road pricing schemes like this. But even with road pricing schemes, it's very hard to avoid, at least if you implement it according to, to, uh, to, s uh, to the social cost perspective, it's very hard to avoid growth at all. You will have some growth, but it may be more balanced than we, ans than we have seen up to now. But to, to, to have growth only by walking and cycling, then you need really to, to, to price the, the use of uh, motorized vehicles very high. And then you have, <coughs> have the planning objectives that could, uh, could uh, go together with, with the land use factors here. I, I, I am really mostly focused on urban density as, as the main planning challenge uh, or the main challenge in, uh, in uh, when we talk about transport planning. Urban structures, including density, is the main challenge. If you manage to, to solve the urban spreading problem, then I think it's, uh, it's uh, fairly easy to, let's say, establish attractive centers where you can have a nice, uh, let's say, nice design and, uh, and uh, facilities for walking and, and cycling. But the underlying forces is can be found in this picture. Pricing and also in this picture. How you design the network, where you price where you choose to put the the, the places where you can charge the, the use of, of roads the way you design charges of public transport systems, that is the main challenge. And we'll talk more about that in the, in the subsequent lectures. Okay, any questions? It's, uh, yep. Private. 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 Private marginal cost. Social marginal cost. This is what uh, people pay in terms of time and, uh, and other costs. This is what people pay in terms of time and uh, other costs. In but in addition, you also have to pay for the extra time that your use of the system causes extra for all the others as well. So when you enter, these people move slow, uh, slower, and that's the difference between these two curves. Okay, we break again. <laughs>